Now that we've talked about complex numbers in some detail, let's see what to do in a case where our characteristic polynomial has complex roots. Um, so let's just recall what problem we were solving. Uh, so recall, uh, we are solving, we're solving a um, second order differential equation, um, y double prime plus a y prime, a is just a constant, plus by equals zero, okay? So this is a second order linear homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients. And, um, and so the main idea, as we've seen, is to make a good guess for a solution, and our guess is just going to be an exponential, e to the rt. And then we take the derivative and the second derivative, plug it in here, and what we end up with after canceling the e to the rt factor is the characteristic polynomial. Characteristic polynomial. And our characteristic polynomial uh, is r squared plus a r plus b. Okay, that equals zero. Okay, and so uh, two lectures ago, we talked about what to do when this has real roots. That was pretty self-explanatory. We just immediately get two solutions. And then based on some properties of uh, solutions to linear second order differential equations, we were just able to write down a general solution right away. But what do we do if we have complex roots? So what if we have complex roots? Okay. So the first fact is that if a quadratic polynomial has a complex root, and these coefficients here are just real numbers, right? which we're assuming, um, well then what can we say? So if it has one complex root, the other root is complex as well. But we can even say more than that. These roots actually have to come in, um, they have to come as a complex conjugate pair. So in other words, the roots will look like a plus bi and a minus bi, okay? This is actually a general fact about polynomials of any degree. The roots always come in complex conjugate pairs. Um, by complex conjugate, I just mean, um, so the complex conjugate of a plus bi is a minus bi. We just flip the sign of the bi part. Um, and, you know, for quadratic equations, this is fairly easy to see. Um, if you write down the quadratic formula, you'll see that you actually get something of, of this form. There's that plus or minus in the quadratic formula. Um, and we'll do an example of this um, at the end of the lecture, where a and b are, are uh, particular numbers. Okay, um, so we know that the roots are going to look like this, a plus bi and a minus bi, uh, but what do we do with that? So let's actually start by considering, well, we can pick either one. Let's take a plus bi. Okay, so we'll take a plus bi as one of the roots. Call that r1, I guess. And then, um, well, what do we conclude? So what we did in the real root case is we just said that e to the r1t, so a plus bi times t, right? So r is this whole complex number here. What do, we, what do we say? I mean, this is a solution, right? But it's a complex solution. So it's a complex solution in this case to the differential equation. And likewise with the other root, if we take a minus bi, we get a complex solution e to the a minus bi times t. Okay, well, that's, that's good and all, but Often in applications, we don't want complex solutions. We actually want real solutions. For example, y of t could be describing a mass attached to a spring, the position of a mass attached to a spring. Okay. Um, and so a complex function isn't going to help us. We want to know, you know, what is the actual position of this mass? 
in meters or, uh, or whatnot. Um, okay, so how do we, the question is, how do we turn this into a real solution? And um, there's an important fact. I'm going to say why this is true as well. But um, the fact is, let's say we have a complex solution. So if y of t is a complex solution, so comple a complex valued solution, I, say, I should say, to um, let's just let's do this in a little more generality even so so it can be any homogeneous linear differential equation so we don't need constant coefficients it can be uh, so linear differential equation and let's actually write out a linear differential equation so um, y double prime uh, plus, we'll call this p of t times y prime plus q of t times y equals zero because it's homogeneous, right? Okay, so if we have a complex valued solution, well then, what can we conclude? Then, actually, the real part, so this is what we defined last lecture, the real part of our complex solution and the imaginary part those are both real solutions they're real they're real valued solutions to the differential equation and recall what this means real part and imaginary part of a complex function we can write any complex function as its real part plus i times its imaginary part. Okay, we're, and we did an example last time where we, we took, I think it was e to the a plus b i t, and we split that into its real part and its imaginary part. Um, okay, so why is this true? Why? Well, let's uh, first split our y of t into its real part and imaginary part. So let's write, um, y of t as, uh, I want to write this whole thing. I'll just call it a real part, r of t, okay? And then the i times the imaginary part, the imaginary part I'll call capital I of t, okay? So these are both real valued functions. We can always split a function into its real and imaginary parts. Um, okay, and we're supposing that this is a solution to the differential equation. So what are we going to do? Um, well, let's just plug our solution in and then write down what we get. So what is y double prime? It's just going to be r double prime plus i, capital I double prime. And then we have plus p of t times r prime plus i, capital I prime plus uh, qt times r plus i, capital I prime, and that equals zero. We know this already for a fact, right? We're not trying to show this because we know that y of t is a complex solution. So it satisfies this differential equation. That's the true statement. What do I want to show? I want to show that r and i it's themselves satisfy the differential equation. And to do that, I'm just going to write the r's together. So I have r double prime plus p of t times r prime plus q of t times r um, and then the i's. So I have um, uh, the imaginary unit i. And I'll factor that out of all of these. So I have i double prime plus p of t times i prime plus q of t times i. Okay, and I know for a fact that equals zero. Well, wait a second. So this equals zero. This is some, okay. So this is some real number here. Right, here's a real fun a real valued function, I should say, right? And this is some real valued function here. Okay. And so for 
For any particular value of t, this is a complex number. Something plus i something. Both of these are real. And that equals the complex number zero. Right? Zero is, is just zero plus zero i, right? That's the complex number zero. So a complex number is zero exactly when its real part and its imaginary part are zero. Okay? So we're actually this this thing here actually equals zero, and this thing here equals zero. Well, what do we just do? We just show that R and I are solutions, and they're real valued solutions. They're real solutions to the uh, differential equation. Okay, so R and I are real valued solutions. Okay, um, so again, this tells us how we can obtain real solutions from complex ones. So let's go back to this solution we have. So um, that's the end of that. Um, now we have uh, y of t is, well, the one we got from our differential equation is e to the a plus bi times t. Okay, we want to pick out the real and imaginary parts of this, and I'll do this quickly because we actually did this in the previous lecture. So first idea is to use our property of exponents. And then do you remember the idea here? We are going to use Euler's formula. We have something of the form e to the i times something. So this is e to the at times, remember Euler's formula says cosine e to the i theta is cosine theta, which is bt, plus i sine theta. So I have another e to the at here. Um, i sine theta, All right? So sine bt. Okay, so this right here is my real part, and this is my imaginary part. Okay. This is the real part of y, and this is the imaginary part of y. Remember that notation we use for real and imaginary parts. Okay, great. So what does that mean? That means, uh, so, y1, um, we'll call this y1, e to the at cosine bt, and um, this one here, we'll call that y2, e to the at sine bt, what do we conclude? Right, so these are solutions. These are real solutions to the differential equation, right? These are just nice real valued functions. There's no complex numbers in them. So they're solutions to the differential equation. Okay. That's great. So, um, and the other thing we have to check, so what do we need to form the general solution? We need two linearly independent solutions, but these are linearly independent, right? We have a sine and a cosine. These are not simply multiple, uh, constant multiples of each other, right? If you, if you divide one by the other, you don't get a constant, right? You get tangent BT, I suppose. Um, so since these are, since these are linearly independent, Uh, we can just write down a general solution. So a general solution is, what is it? It's, um, if we have two solutions, y1 and y2, it's c1 y1 plus c2 y2. So we can multiply each of them by any constant we want and then add them. So we get c1 e to the at cosine bt plus c2 e to the at sine bt. And that is our general solution to the differential equation in the case where we have complex roots. So that solves this differential equation when we have complex roots. Um, yeah, so this, I mean, this is really beautiful, right? That we get sines and cosines. And this is where they come from. They come from, uh, they come from Euler's formula. Um, so 
before we do an example, I just want to point out one thing that probably uh, some of you were wondering about. So, um, yeah, up here. So we had two roots, right? We had a plus bi and we had a minus bi. But if you look at what we did, we, we only took one of those, right? And, and so we have the solution e to the a plus bi t. And from that complex solution, we actually got two real solutions just from that one complex solution. So you might say, well, wait, wait a second. Wait, what about that other root? Like, what if we, what if we had used that other root instead? So what if we use, uh, yeah, let's just, let's just try to address that. So what if we use, what if we used the other root? I'll call that R two, a minus b i instead. And so let's trace through and see what would be different. Right, so we have a minus bi, so we have minus b, we end up with, ah, okay, so we end up with the same thing, but we have a cosine minus bt, and we have a sine minus bt, okay, like that. Well, is this any different than what we had up here? That's the question. Okay, so cosine is what's called an even function. And so cosine of negative x is the same as cosine of x. It has this, um, it has this symmetry across the, um, the y-axis, right? So, so because cosine is an even function, this is actually just equal to cosine bt. Okay, it's a property of cosine, property of any even function, in fact. Um, and sine is an odd function. So what is an odd function? An odd function has 180 degree rotational symmetry around the origin. So here's our plot of sine, right? So it has this 180 degree rotational symmetry. If you rotate a picture 180 degrees, you get the same thing. Um, and then mathematically, that means that sine of, neg sine of negative x equals negative sine of x. So here we actually get this is equal to negative sine of bt. So notice here we don't get anything different. Here all that happens is we get a negative sign that comes out. But we could just put that negative sign inside of the C2. Right? C2 is an arbitrary constant. It could be positive or negative. So it turns out if we use the other root, we get the exact same general solution. And so we actually only need to use um, one of the one of the pair of complex conjugate roots here. Uh, so this is the general method for solving differential equation of this form when we have complex roots. Okay, so let's now solve an initial value problem. Okay, um, so let's, let's do an example. So we'll solve the initial value problem, initial value problem um, and here's my initial value problem, y double prime plus 2y prime plus 5y equals 0. Okay, so there's my differential equation. What are my initial conditions? Uh, so we'll do um, y of 0 equals 3. And I'll tell you what y prime of 0 is, and that will be 5. So there's my initial value problem. So it's a second order linear homogeneous differential equation because it equals zero with constant coefficients. So because it has constant coefficients, we know that the guess for the solution that will work is e to the RT. And then we plug that guess in, um, cancel out the e to the RTs and we get the uh, characteristic polynomial. Characteristic polynomial ends up being r squared plus 2r plus 5 equals 0. Okay, uh, well, it's not obvious that we can factor this. Um, so let's use a quadratic formula. So my roots are going to be 
negative b, negative 2, plus or minus square root of 2 squared minus 4 times 5, I guess, so minus 20. Now it'll all be over 2a, which is 2. Okay. Um, well, what do we get here? So we get negative 16 inside the square root. So, ah, so we have complex roots. And um, well, what is the square root of negative 16? Square root of 16 is 4. Uh, so the square root of negative 16 is going to be 4i. I is the square root of negative 1. And we can just distribute that too. So we have minus 1 plus or minus 2i. Those are our two roots. Again, we see that we have written this in the form. I'll get the other page. Um, a plus or minus bi. So that's what I meant that we could write both the roots um, as complex conjugates. We have minus 1 plus 2i and minus 1 minus 2i. But remember, uh, the idea now is we only actually will need to use one of those. So let's take the one with the plus. So I'm just copying down my, my solution, my guess. So it's e to the negative 1 plus 2i times t. And um, we can go through this quickly. So e to the negative t, e to the 2i t. The idea is we use Euler's formula here. So we get e to the negative t times uh, e to the 2i t is cosine 2t plus i sine 2t by Euler's formula. So cosine 2t plus i, uh, I guess I'll distribute through this e to the negative t, um, negative sine 2t. Don't forget that i in Euler's formula. Right? Okay, um, well now what do we have? We have a real part of e to the negative t cosine 2t and an imaginary part of e to the negative t sine 2t. And by what we just proved on the other page, both of those are individually going to be real solutions to the differential equation, which means I can immediately write down the general solution. It'll be C1 times the first one, e to the negative t cosine 2t, plus C2 times the second one. Notice I don't put the i in, right? As I just want the imaginary part. The imaginary part does not include the i. It's just what's multiplied by the i. So C2, e to the negative t, sine 2t. And this is my general solution. These are all real, right? Nothing imaginary about it. Um, great, okay. So um, let's use our initial condition. We'll use y of 0 equals 3. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that 3 is going to equal c1 times, this just ends up being 1, right? Because e to the 0 is 1, cosine of 0 is 1. So c1 plus c2 times a sine, the sine of 0 is 0. So that term just all goes away. So c1 is 3. Right off the bat, we know that. Um, Okay, let's use our second initial condition. So we need to take the derivative. We take the derivative of this formula here. And looks like we need to use the product rule here. Right? So we'll take the derivative of this e to the negative t part first. So that's minus c1 e to the negative t cosine 2t. Then we'll do the derivative of that part. I'm just using the product rule um, plus and now it'll become a sign, actually, a minus sign. So we have a minus 2 c1 e to the negative t sine 2t. And then we have a plus negative c2 e to the 2t sine 2t plus 2 c2 e to the negative t cosine 2t. So again, a product rule. And we're plugging in. Um, y prime of 0 equals 5. So 5 is going to equal, um, what do we get? So, okay, so first of all, notice that the sine terms, again, are just going to become 0 because we're plugging in 0 for t. 
And these are just going to become one. So we get five equals negative C1 plus uh, two C2. Okay. But C1 is three. Right. So I get um, so I get eight equals two C two, or C two equals four. Great. So I have C two there, and I have C one there, and we can finally write down our solution. So our solution to the initial value problem is three e to the negative t cosine two t plus uh, four e to the negative t sine two t. Great. Um, all right, so I could end this lecture right here, but I feel like I really want to understand what what this function looks like, right? We have a e, an exponential times a cosine, an exponential times a sine. Yeah, can we try to make some sense of you know what 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 this is going to look like here? So. So let's first um, factor out that e to the negative t. It's practically begging for that. We have 3 cosine 2t plus 4 sine 2t. Okay. So now what does this thing look like? Right. Well, what I want you to notice is that the 2 is, is the same in both of them, right? They, they, they both have the same frequency. So it's the same frequency. And what, what is that, that two measuring? It's measuring it's like how rapid the oscillations are for the cosine and the sine. Okay. And so there's a really cool fact that whenever we have um, an expression of this form, we can actually write it as just a single sine or cosine. So this is another, you know, it doesn't look might think, oh, if you had a sine and cosine, it might you know, sort of get crazy looking like this, but you know, it's not, it's not going to happen. Actually, something like this is just going to end up looking like a sine wave or a cosine wave. I haven't thought about an e to negative t part yet, but yeah, I'm just saying something like this. It's going to look like a, a, a sine wave. Um, that sine wave might be shifted, and it might be you know, the we'll have to figure out what the amplitude of that sine wave is as well. Um, but the fact is, we're going we're gonna to talk about how to do this. So we can actually write something of this form. So C1 times a cosine. I'm going to call that frequency omega. That's a, that's a letter that's uh, uh, typically used for this frequency here. Angular frequency, it's called. Um, so C1 cosine omega t plus C2, possibly a different number there, right, like we have, sine omega t. So we can write this um, in the form A cosine omega t, but possibly with a horizontal shift. Right? So we can either write it as a cosine. Or we can write it as a sign. It's our choice. And notice that that sine wave is going to have the same frequency, that same omega that we started with. Right? By the way, I should mention, if the omegas are also different, then yeah, we absolutely can get something like this first picture. Uh, it's going to look more chaotic. Um, so we're assuming that we have the same frequency it's always going to work out that way in these kind of problems, right? If you trace back where that frequency is coming from, it's actually coming from that too there. Um, okay. So, well, that's great. I told you we can write it in this form, uh, but how do you actually do it? Um, so let's, let's see how you actually do it. Um, and so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with... Let's, let's try to do the cosine. So let's write it as a single cosine. A cosine omega t minus phi. And um, 
what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start from this. So I want to find, I want to find A and, so omega is, again, that's already determined. It's the same omega, but I want to find A and phi. Um, so I'm going to start with this. I'm actually going to use a Turgenandy to simplify this. So this is the same as, right, we have a difference here. So this is going to be cosine omega t times cosine phi plus sine omega t times sine phi. Okay. And that's just a, um, that's a trig identity. The trig identity looks like, um, well, it's right down here. Uh, let's do both of them. So cosine uh, x plus y is cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y. But then if we had cosine x minus y, and you do cosine x cosine y plus sine x sine y. This is, this is sometimes how this is written, just to kind of cleverly combine both formulas into one. So if you have the minus, you pick the plus there. If you have the plus there, you pick the minus there. Um, and so, um, well, how is this helpful? Here's how this is helpful. This looks an awfully like a lot, awfully lot like this right here. So I'm just going to write that underneath actually, just to compare. So C1 cosine omega T, C2 sine, um, omega T. And notice that we have this, um, this cosine omega T there. And it's sine omega t there. And so these will be exactly the same if, um, if C1 equals A cosine phi. See that number there is the same as whatever the number is here, which is A cosine phi. And we also want C2 to equal what? We want C2 to equal A sine phi. Um, okay, well, we want to find phi and A, right? We're given C1 and C2. We want to find phi and A. So this is a system of two equations, but it's a highly nonlinear system of two equations, right? So how do we actually solve this? Okay, so how do we solve this? Well, um, I think the quickest way is to take advantage of this trig identity, cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to square both these equations. Okay. And this one is C2 squared. I'm going to add these. See if I add them, then this just becomes one. Cosine squared, well, it becomes A squared. Right? And this side becomes, uh, so I'm adding these two equations, this side becomes C1 squared plus C2 squared equals A squared. And that tells me what A is in terms of C1 and C2. We eliminated phi using this clever trick here. So C1 squared plus C2 squared, square root. Okay, nice. Um, what else are we trying to find? We're trying to find what is this horizontal shift here, right? And um, the easiest way to do that is actually not to plug this in for A, but to just um, use the fact that sine phi divided by cosine phi is tangent of phi. So I'm going to divide these. I'm going to do this equation divided by that one. So I get C2 over C1 is the A's cancel. So I just get tangent of phi. So then phi is going to be the arc tan C2 over C1. Um, let's circle these or box them. So these are going to be really useful. So this tells us if we have something of this form, um, we can write it as a single cosine um, where this is A, this is phi. And um, I'll give you a quick problem. 
This is a good one to try. So I want you to imitate this method. Uh, to find similar formulas. Uh, sorry, you can't see that. <laughs> Here it is. Similar formulas for um, for phi and A in terms of C1 and C2. Um, C1 and C2 for, um, for writing it as the sine instead. So what if we wanted to write it as a sine? We have A. Okay. So we do the same thing. Again, we have to use a trig identity. Um, so what is sine of X plus Y, let's say. So this one is sine X um, cosine y plus sine y cosine x, like that. And what if we put the minus? You can actually kind of just figure out what, what will happen when we put the minus, because um, what will, the minus will go there and there. Cosine is even function is an even function, so that, that just becomes cosine y. Sine is an odd function, so sine of minus y is minus sine y, so that minus actually comes out there too. Yeah, so do the same thing. Um, try to get formulas for a and phi. You'll actually find out that, I mean, it's kind of a spoiler, but uh, the formula for a is going to be the same, but the formula for phi will be a little bit different. Um, so try that. And before I end this lecture, I just want to come back to our example so here's our example. Uh, let me write that down. E to the negative t times three cosine two t plus four sine two t. Let's write that as a single cosine using our formulas. So this is the same as E to the negative t times what? Times, okay. A is going to be C1 plus C1 squared plus C2 squared, and take the square root. Here's C1, here's C2. Three squared plus four squared, that's five squared, right? It's a Pythagorean triple. Um, so this is five. Um, okay, so that A is going to be five, right? So I have five cosine omega t. Omega is two, right? Because that's my omega. So cosine two t minus phi. Well, what is my phi? It's just the arctan of c2 over c1. So arctan of four over three. And I have a lot of parentheses here. But um, yes, essentially I can write it as exponential times a cosine. Okay. Well, why do we want to write it in this form? Um, easy. That's just because it's much easier to see what's going on in this form. Right? So what, what's really going on when we have a cosine function? It's just a cosine. It's shifted a little bit, right? but it's just a cosine. What happens when we're multiplying that by an exponential? So what happens is we can think of this piece here as a sort of uh, as a sort of amplitude. It's like a decreasing amplitude of the cosine. Okay, why is it decreasing? Because the e to the negative t is a decreasing function. So um, let me actually try to draw that. So this dotted line. I'm gonna draw. Let's say this this right here is the function y equals five e to the negative t. Okay, and then I'm actually going to draw this on the other side too. Okay, here's my t-axis. Here's my y-axis. Okay, and then I have a cosine, 
and it's shifted by this uh, this bit here. I don't know exactly what that cosine is going to look like, but um, actually I do kind of know, right? <laughs> I know that at zero it's three and uh, its derivative is positive, so it's going up. So maybe it's yeah, maybe it's something like this, and that cosine. So we're just going to oscillate. It's going to be constrained by this sort of amplitude envelope here. Okay, so it's going to go. It's going to look like that. Okay, very cool. Um, and then what is okay? So one one more concept. So we call omega is the angular frequency. Okay. And then I'm also going to define the period, which is 2 pi over omega. That's the period. Okay. And the angular frequency, the meaning of the angular frequency is, is, is it's a little bit harder to see geometrically. Again, I, I what I said was it's, it's essentially the speed of these vibrations, the speed of these oscillations. Um, and But the period is very easy to see on a graph. The period is this right here. So you go from one of the crests of this sine wave to another one. And so this is the period right here. This is the... Um, this is the period. And what is the period for, for this problem? Uh, well, it's two, it's two pi over two because two is our, is our angular frequency. So the period is pi. So this distance here is pi. Um, okay, so that's enough uh, for this lecture. Um, I think it's pretty cool that we were able to you know, sketch a, a pretty accurate graph, I think, of this um, fairly complicated looking uh, looking function. And I also think it's, it's, it's just really quite nice how these sines and cosines appear um, in, in these solutions. Um, and the link is, yeah, this complex exponential. It's, uh, it's really the link between yeah, exponentials and sines and cosines. Um, okay, so in the next lecture, we're going to talk about what do we do in the case of a repeated real root. So we have just one real root, but it occurs with multiplicity too. Um, so I'll see you next time.